of particles is here the main topic today. As in the first webinar, approximately six months ago, I would like to give a brief introduction into our seminar today. First of all, I would thank also the organizers, Radek Stocek and Reinhold Kipschall, uh, uh, for the efforts uh, to bring this second webinar in the way. We have today mainly three speakers. In the first part of this seminar, after my introduction, Professor Reto Kiere from the University of Pennsylvania in the United States uh, will report about his chapter in the last book that we have uh, released and that we have edited under the title Degradation uh, of uh, Rubber Materials, etc. I will give now in the introduction a short information of this book. In the second part of our webinar, I myself will give an introduction in the chapter I have written together with my friend Manfred Glibel from Hanover uh, about uh, the tire road friction uh, coming especially from passenger car tires. And last but not least, uh, Mr. Professor Stocek from Slin University and from PRL will report about his chapters in this book. I think that approximately at 3.45 uh, European time, uh, we will finish that seminar. Here again, you see the background of the webinar. In the last webinar, we gave an introduction uh, about the general content and about some chapters of the book that was uh, uh, edited uh, in and appeared in the last year about the topic fatigue crack row in rubber materials experiments and modeling. Meanwhile, uh, this book reached more than 22,000 excesses and uh, chapters from this book uh, are cited in other literature, meanwhile, 74 times. The new book that uh, was released, uh, and uh, you can uh, buy that book or you can download the uh, e version of this book that has a title Degradation of Elastomers in Practice, Experiments and Modeling. And even this book uh, reached approximately 4,000 excesses uh, and uh, also six times chapters from these books were. Uh, cited in other literature, and it is uh, a pleasure also to note that uh, this chapter of uh, Professor Gier from United States um, about he will report today uh, had uh, uh, the most excesses. Uh, meanwhile, I think it was approximately 350 excesses, but even more. The background of the webinar uh, um, has also. Uh, the task, of course, uh, to uh, give a short hint to the next book that is just in preparation and I hope it will appear in 2024. This is a book uh, we will uh, edit together also with Professor Likam from France and the title of this book will be Advances in Understanding Thermal Effects in Rubber, Experiments, Modeling and Practical Relevance. I have here listed some keywords, rubber materials, hysteresis, heat generation, self-heating, heat diffusion, heat buildup, kinetics of temperature fields, failure tires, testing methods, analytical modeling, and numerical simulations are the contents and the key points uh, within this book that is in preparation. But now let us switch back uh, to the uh, book about we will report today degradation of elastomers in practice, experiments and modeling. This is here a brief overview about the contents in this book. This book provides recent research to identify and quantify the abundance of tire abrasion particles in different environments to determine their toxicity and to reduce both their emission and emission environment. Furthermore, this book reports how oxidative and thermal aging of rubber 
is accelerated by mechanical stress, reactive gases like ozone and so on. It shows also examples how the addition of antioxidants, UV stabilizers and anti-ozonase can slow down or even prevent these problems that are related uh, with aging, uh, degradation and so on. Furthermore, this book reports about fundamental processes of rubber friction and tropology, about internal material fatigue and structural thermooxidative oxidative control changes in rubber. Uh, uh, all these effects, uh, you know, that may be better than me, cause and accompanize the material degradation, which is a very important issue, especially in rubber industry and especially in tire industry. And last but not least, um, I would like to mention that this book uh, provides also an up-to-date overview of certain studies on abrasion, wear and thermooxidative aging phenomena. It includes, includes physical fracture mechanics, tribological chemical and physical chemical aspects, as well as it presents new laboratory test methods that uh, allow us uh, to predict in the laboratory in a very good manner uh, a lot of these phenomena. Uh, I have here also listed uh, the titles of the chapters. We can do that uh, relatively fast uh, because uh, some of these chapters will then be presented uh, uh, in the, the next part of this webinar. I myself will report about this chapter, Basic Mechanism and Predictive Testing of Tire Road Abrasions. We have a nice chapters by Klippel and Jung about thermooxidative aging, mechanical fatigue of elastomers. You see here on the right side an example of the so-called boiler curves in energy density representation for many rubbers uh, that have a real practical application. We also have a contribution from SRI, Sumitomo so Tires in Japan, about a novel approach on analyzing mechanochemical wear mechanisms. You see here as an example a graph that shows the difference, the improvement uh, concerning the wear rate uh, in air or in nitrogen if you take instead of a classical a uh, tread rubber compound based on SBR, a new kind of tread rubber compound and that is in this, in this case a hydrogenated uh, uh, styrene polyethylene rubber. And in this part also you find very interesting molecular simulations uh, that give a molecular based explanation of these effects. You also have a contribution from uh, the group in Hanover, uh, sorry, in Dresden, from the TU Dresden of Professor Kaliske, uh, Benke Kaliske. They give insights into multi-physical modeling and simulation of thermal damage of elastomers. Uh, you see here uh, uh, in this sketch how thermal damage creates kind of cavities, a sea, a lake of cavities, and how these cavities form cracks and how one can simulate the crack propagation in uh, uh, specific geometries of the corresponding rubber parts. Other chapters come from Zlin. Uh, Mr. Stocek itself will report uh, about these chapters. For example, the experimental numerical description of the heat build-up phenomena under cyclic loading. Also a chapter that is meanwhile more than 300 times um, downloaded from this book. Uh, we have a contribution uh, from UK, from the group of James Busfield about the effect of thermal aging on the fatigue resistance of HNBR of hydrogenated octrel nitrile butadien rubber. And we have also a contribution uh, from Germany, uh, from a group in Merseburg about the effect of antioxidants on the aging behavior of natural rubber and of solution styrene put in rubber materials. Uh, 
Also an interesting chapter uh, was written by Saha and Bomik. Uh, Bomik is uh, in the moment in Houston, United States, uh, and uh, they have given an interesting chapter information about the application of the erectic force field method uh, uh, to simulate in the sense of molecular dynamic simulation the thermal and thermal oxidative degradation of, rather, of rubbers. Another contribution from Chebain from the group of Professor Urayama uh, is dealing with the experimental analysis of uh, fast crack and elastomers. Uh, and here it is interesting to note uh, that uh, the strain energy release rates were measured uh, parallel with the local crack tip strain fields uh, in various types of biaxial deformations. So that is uh, also an uh, interesting uh, chapter uh, about the fact uh, that uh, the uh, um, phenomena having to do with crack uh, propagation, crack uh, uh, initiation depend also from the type uh, of excitation, whether it is planar, whether it is uni equal biaxial deformation, or whether it is an axial deformation and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, this is very sensitive. We also have uh, chapters also from Slin about the effect of the apparent crosslink density on the cut and chip wear behavior in natural rubber. Uh, we have a chapter from Jacob Tires in India about uh, the parameters which are influencing the fatigue characteristic of tire tread rubber compounds. You see here a sketch. Uh, this is a crack grow rate measured with the tear fatigue analyzer uh, for compounds consisting of natural rubber, uh, styrene rubber, and a blend of natural and styrene rubber uh, at elevated temperature, in that case at 70 degrees. So it also shows the influence of the uh, uh, thermal effects on this crack row behavior in these uh, materials that, of course, you know, that uh, are very important for tire applications. And the last chapter in this book um, comes from Hannover, from the German Rubber Institute. Uh, 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 Professor Ulrich Gieser and co-workers have delivered a chapter about the mechanistic and kinetic studies on the degradation process of rubber types. And here, and uh, I know they are specialists also in these uh, methods. Uh, here you see a very interesting introduction with many examples into the special method of chemiluminescence. No? That is not so well known uh, in uh, um, other groups and is also not uh, so highly distributed uh, uh, around the world. Uh, so I can recommend also uh, this chapter, uh, not only because of using the chemiluminescence method, there are also other methods uh, uh, that give parallel information about the artificial aging and mechanical deaths, uh, the estimation of crosslink density with different methods, residual peroxide determinations, uh, and so on. So, last but not least, uh, 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 I would like to uh, 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 give you, uh, or, or I would like to wish that you have an interesting seminar uh, based on the next presentations. Enjoy this uh, webinar and uh, maybe uh, uh, we will have soon also the opportunity to report in the third seminar, the date is to now not yet fixed, uh, but in the third webinar, maybe in six months or um, uh, in one year, I don't know now exactly, we can then maybe report also about the third book I have briefly introduced at the beginning of this uh, part of my presentation. So please enjoy the webinar and- All right, so then- uh... Let me start my presentation. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm um, excited to tell you a little bit about tire abrasion particles in the environment. And that's a subject that it becomes increasingly important 
um, perhaps you have seen the news about these um, particles, and they are also a concern. And I want to show you a little bit of an overview now, what we have to, what we have learned so far, and where we have to go in the future. So tires have two main problems. Uh, one problem is that, as you know, you have to replace your tires every you know couple of years or so, and that means that we end up with scrap tires, waste tires. So that's a whole separate topic. In some countries, they are burned. In some countries, they are landfilled. But we don't have time to talk about that. What I want to talk about today is because you have to replace your tires, it means you have lost tire material. And that's usually the profile. I hope you can see my mouse here. Um, the profile of the tires is being abraded, and that's why we have to replace it. So what happens to these tire wear particles? And so that is what I would like to discuss today. These um, tire particles are part of what we call non-exhaust emissions. And you see on the right-hand side here, tire wear. So as we drive a car on a road, it's necessary that we have this friction, which eventually will abrade the tread material from the tire. And these particles end up on the road and in the environment in general. Other non-exhaust emissions include road wear particles and brake wear particles. So each time you stop the car, you hit the brakes, you will emit brake wear particles. So these are the three main types of non-exhaust emissions when you drive a vehicle. And just um, to start with, if we, if we change the entire fleet to electric cars, these things will not change or not much. In fact, it is predicted that because of the weight of electric cars that the tire wear amount that is ab abraded will increase because of the higher weight of the cars. What will go down, of course, is the exhaust emissions. So proportionally, we will we'll increase these non-exhaust emissions into the environment. Let me give you a, a brief overview of what we have in road dust. So if you study a road surface, there's always dust there. And we've done a study of several highways and roads in Germany. And on average, these particles have um, a diameter of about 10 to 80 micrometers. And what I'm showing here is an average composition of road dust in, on German highways. And you see that 54% by volume of all particles on the road are actually tire wear. You see brake wear is less abundant. Road wear, so particles from the road surface, are also quite abundant. But the, the dominant particle type is definitively tire wear. Now, and that means we have to know a little bit about tires. And most of you probably know that tires are made of rubber or synthetic polymers as a, as a major component. This is an average composition of a reference passenger car tire. So rubber and polymers are a dominant component. And then depending on the tires, you have steels and textiles. All car tires have fillers in there, usually carbon black or um, nanoparticles of silica. And then many other additives, such as elasticizers or anti-oxidators um, and things like that. Now, when we drive a car and we actually abrade the tires, what is abraded is not the entire tire, but it's actually the tread. So we have to know what is the tread composed of. And this is a data from a um, paper that shows a Danish tire, about 51% are rubber polymers. And you know the rest are different components, fillers and softening agents and anti-ozonators and things like that. So what, mean, what this means is that as we drive a car and we abrade our tires, we emit a high amount of rubber polymers which is, in a current description, is actually a, a plastic. So tire particles are actually microplastics. Not only that, they are called primary microplastics because they are emitted in the size range, which we call microplastics, which is between one micrometer and about, about one millimeter. So that's the modern definition of microplastic. So as we drive our cars, we emit microplastics in primary form. And primary is 
the, the word is important because it's not the same as secondary microplastics, which are produced in the environment, for example, through degradation of plastic bottles or other plastic materials, large objects that degrade into smaller and smaller objects. So we emit primary microplastics. So the question is now, how much do we emit? And this is a diagram from the book, actually, where we looked at the emission factors. We studied the literature and compiled the data. And what you see here is from left to right, we increase the weight of the vehicles. So on the very left-hand side, you have a car, an average passenger car, and you see average emissions are about 100 milligrams per kilometer driven or vehicle kilometers. So one, 100 milligrams, it means per kilometer. So when we drive one kilo, uh, 10 kilometers, for example, we have emitted one gram. And the emissions of a heavy duty vehicle, a truck, for example, is almost 10 times larger, right? So these are the rough estimates that we have so far. These are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of analyses that are in this diagram. And you see there's a distinct trend. The heavier the vehicle, the more we emit. And as I said, the average values are shown here. Now, the same trend also holds <clears throat> when we look at different types of roads, because the surface of the road also has an impact on how much tire is abraded. And you see here urban or highway or rural roads, they all show the same trend, increasing weight, increasing emission. All right, so that, that tells us already something that a smaller car emits definitively less. When we extrapolate the data, uh, we can come up with estimates for tire wear emissions globally. And the highlighted countries here are those for which we have good data. The data are mostly from Cole et al. from 2019, a very good publication that I can re recommend to you. And with amendments and several other publications for specific countries. <clears throat> and you see here some interesting trends. For example, in India, <clears throat> it is about 0.2 kilograms per capita per year. On the other end, we have the United States with five kilograms per capita per year. And these are, this is a remarkable spread. Now, the question, of course, is why do we have that? Globally, the estimates are about six million tons per year that are emitted. There are a lot of assumptions in there, and we don't have time to go into the details, but this is a rough estimate, six million tons of tire wear particles are emitted into the environment globally every single year. And in some countries, much more than in others. What happens to these particles? You have here on the left-hand side, the road surface, that's where we actually create the tire abrasion particles. They end up on the road surface. Some are ending up in the atmosphere, as you see up here, the, the arrow. Um, the atmosphere, of course, they can also deposit again back onto the road surface. They can also be deposited on various other surfaces such as lakes, water bodies, soil vegetation, and so on. So the question now is what happens to these once they are emitted? The most important delivery channel for tire abrasion particles to the environment is road runoff. This blue box is the key to everything that happens later on. So it delivers the accumulated tire wear particles and of course other particles in the road dust as well to various compartments, environmental compartments. And you see rivers, lakes, estuaries, and the ocean, for example, or soils. So next to a highway, the soils will be contaminated with tire particles. It can be ending up on the leaves of vegetables or, or trees. It, we, it, it can end up in organisms in the ocean or on land, and we can consume organisms that contain tire particles, for example, shrimp, or contain particularly many tire particles. So when you consume that, you will ingest tire particles. So this is showing you roughly what happens to tire particles once, once they are deposited on the road surface. And of course, when they are in the, on the road surface, with traffic continuing, traffic is actually causing turbulence and these particles will be lifted off the surface only to be deposited a few meters or 100 meters down the road or on the soil and vegetation near the road. One particular arrow I want to point out, the runoff from streets. So the drainage from roads can also be moved to wastewater treatment facilities. Oops, sorry. 
And of course, in the wastewater treatment facilities, we can remove that or significant portions of that. Now, wastewater treatment facilities typically collect the sludge, and most higher particles will end up in this sludge. Now, imagine you take this sludge, as is done in many countries, and you use it as an agricultural fertilizer, which means that the sludge that we produce over here in the wastewater treatment facility will be directly deposited on soil, and therefore we contaminate our farmland. In some countries, this has been um, made illegal. So in some countries, you are not allowed anymore to use wastewater sludges and use them as fertilizer on fields, for example. But anyway, if we treat this wastewater, we significantly reduce the input into the aquatic systems. Now, eventually, if you end up in the aquatic system as a tire particle, you enter the oceans. And this is a picture showing microplastics from a, a, a beach. And there's a recent estimate on the amount of tire particles that reach the ocean. And this is an estimate by, made in, by the IUCN, by Boucher and Frio in 2017. And what you see in this image, tire particles are the second most abundant <clears throat> type of particle primary microplastics that enter the ocean. So this is not a, an insignificant amount. It is second only to microplastics re released through washing machines when you wash synthetic textiles. It is estimated that totally 1.5 million tons of tire abrasion particles end up in the ocean. And of these 1.5 million tons, if you take 25,000, 28%, uh, this is roughly 400,000 tons per year end up in the ocean. So compared to the 600, uh, to the 6 million tons that we emit globally, it is a significant portion that ends up in the oceans. The estimates, however, vary quite a bit. You see here the estimates range from 270 to 70 to 920 kilotons per year. This is a significant amount, and therefore it is a problem that we have to address. So let me show you a little bit what we can do to learn more about these tire particles. What the goal is, is to characterize these particles so we understand more what their properties are, what is the chemical composition, for example, and how this would affect environmental compartments. This is along a German highway, and you see here on the right-hand side, this is an, a station where we collect airborne particles, any type of airborne particles, including tire particles. This is a so-called passive sampler, so the, the material that is by turbulence, it's lifted off the surface, it enters this device here where we have a, a settling of the particles in a very um, peaceful environment, so there's no turbulence inside this device. And at the bottom of the device, this is the device here, the air enters and it's calmed down, and so inside we have static conditions and we have settling of the particles Everything above 2.5 micrometers is settling there and we can analyze it relatively easily at the bottom. At the bottom, we have a collection plate that is a, a specific plastic with a glue where these particles collect. And this allows us to actually study the particles in various types of microscopes. For example, in an optical microscope. So when we study these particles, we can automate it and we can find out quantitatively the abundance of different types of particles. And this is the method we use to actually determine, is it a tire abrasion particle? Is it a soil particle? Is it an organic particle or, or maybe a break abrasion particle? Here's an image uh, as an example of such a, um, a sample taken from a highway. And you see very clearly we can identify these black particles here, elongate, these dark opaque particles, these are all tire abrasion particles. You have, of course, other particles in here. For example, here you have a crystal. Do you see my mouse? No, it's not visible. Oh. Um, so on the upper left, you have a crystal with, with a high relief here. Then the red circular object is a pollen. So there are different types of materials but for our context right here, it is the opaque, relatively large particles. And you see the size, they're 550 micrometers or more or less. 
So as I mentioned before, between one micrometer and 100 micrometers are typical sizes for tire particles. Now, this allows us to identify tire particles, but it doesn't tell us anything about the chemistry. And for example, brake abrasion particles would also be opaque. And therefore, we have in this optical microscopy, we can only distinguish that based on shape. But to ob obtain more information, we have to use a scanning electron microscope. And I'm showing you here a particle, a tire particle, a very typical tire particle that shows um, various features. First of all, this shape is very characteristic of tire particles. The second thing you notice is that the surface is completely covered or almost completely covered with dust. That is mineral dust from the road surface, from soil, or brake abrasion particles. So in other words, the tire abrasion particles are not just the thread particles that we abrade. They are coated with lots of other particles. And that's why these particles are more commonly now, since a few years, known as tire and road wear particles, or TRWP. The reason is very clearly shown in this picture. The rubber or the, the polymer inside, uh, or the microplastic, if you like, is covered to various extents by solid materials from the road surface or from the brakes or from soil. This is another example, and you see here very clearly the bright particles are all mineral particles, soil particles, road surface or brake abrasion particles. And now in the scanning electron microscope, we also have the possibility to analyze the chemistry. And when we do that, we can actually quantify and classify the types of particles that are sticking at the surface of these tire particles. And what you see here is the um, abundance of a mineral called quartz, for example, that's silicon dioxide. Plagioclase is, a, is another silicate with sodium and aluminum. Orthoclase, a similar mineral. And so there are various other minerals. Most of these are from the road surface. Some are from adjacent farmland. We can quantify that. And then we also can learn more about the brake abrasion particles, which we need to distinguish because chemically they're very different. Let me now show you that how this encrustment or the coating of these particles changes quite dramatically. On the left-hand side, you have a particle that you have just seen before, lots of mineral components on top of the tire particle. In black, the TLM image that's transmitted light microscopy, you see the opa opaque particle. The big image is a scanning electron microscope image, and it shows all the mineral particles on top. In the middle, the same thing for a different tire particle from a different road. And what is highlighted in this uh, purplish color is what is called a matrix and this matrix is a, a similar coating, but the particles that make up this coating are tiny. So they may be less than a micrometer, and that's not, we cannot analyze this with a scanning electron microscope. This is where most of the tire uh, of the brake abrasion particles are hiding. On the right-hand side, <clears throat> from a different road, you have another tire wear particle, and you see this particular particle has enormous amounts of the coating consists of very, very finely powdered material, and then a few larger chunks of mineral particles from the soil or from the road. So on the right hand side, we have more than 50% of the coating is matrix, so the very finely powdered material. In the middle, you have less than 50%. Now the question is, why do we have that? These samples are from different roads. And what you see, oops, what you see here on the left hand side, where we don't have this matrix phenomenon, this is from a highway with high velocity, where the traffic has high velocities and it's very fluid traffic. In the middle, we have also high velocities, but the cars and trucks stop all the time because it's congested. Lots of trucks are there. So you have a lot of brake action, which not only increases the amounts of tire particles that are abraded, but also more brake abrasion particles shown in, in this purple color. And on the right-hand side, it's a, a road that has low velocity. So this is constantly congested site. 
always stop and go low velocity so the cars roll at very low speeds and you see lots of little particles from brake abrasion so this tells us a little bit about traffic patterns and also about possible solutions now why do we talk about this as i mentioned these tire particles are not just the plastic particle or the polymer parts but the tire particles contain various components first of all these tire particles are in a size range that can be easily ingested and digested, but they could also be inhaled. So if they are emitted into the atmosphere and you're a pedestrian walking near an intersection where everyone has to stop and start again, you will inhale many more tire particles than if you are living in a quiet residential area. So these particles can enter our bodies, but also the bodies of many other organisms. The second concern is that these tire and roadwear particles, they contain chemicals that may have potential health effects. I just list a few here. Zinc, you probably know zinc is an important vulcanizing agent that is added. Zinc in high concentrations is toxic. The second component, butadiene, is obviously a very important component of tires, a major component, and it has recently been classified as carcinogenic to humans. The next component, benzothiazoles, these are special organic components that are added to tires for various purposes. And there are quite a few different types that are added. And these benzothiazoles are biocides and they're potentially aquatoxins and also mutagenic. The next component that is of concern are PAH or polyaromatic hydrocarbons. This is a group of chemicals. Some of these are highly carcinogenic. They are parts of tires. Most importantly, they're part of the carbon black that is added as a filler. And of course, they are emitted along. And then, as you have just seen, these tire particles are coated with other particles from the road surface, which includes brake wear particles. And most importantly among or most characteristic are some elements such as barium, copper, and, and antimony that are kind of characteristic of brake wear particles. Now these components, as these particles are lying in the environment, can be released. And the release of these components of the tire particles is due to physical, chemical, or microbial degradation of the particles in the environment, including um, UV degradation of the particle tire particles. So upon degradation of these particles, we can release these elements, these chemical elements, which means they are available in the environment or their transformation products. For example, benzothiazoles in the environment are transformed relatively easily into other chemicals, which again may be toxic. The research is booming in these areas of toxicity of tire particles, and there are lots of different studies, some contradictory, many point in the direction that there are components in tires that we have to worry about. And perhaps we have to find other replacement substances to reduce the potential toxicity. So what can we do to reduce the amount of tire wear particles or tire and road wear particles in the environment? So first of all, we can try to attack the problem right at the source, which means we could come up with tire materials that have different properties. For example, higher abrasion resistance, and there are significant uh, progress. There has been significant progress, for example, in the development of self-healing materials. And I think that's a promising avenue going forward. Another potential um, gadget that could be installed is a capturing device behind the wheels. This could be a simple cup that tires, um, the wheels would have to have to collect part of the tire particles or to significantly reduce the emissions. The, other, the next point, I just mentioned that the, some of the components in tires, some softening components, some um, you know, anti-ozonators and things like that could perhaps be substituted with less toxic chemicals. And finally, traffic management plays a huge role because the fewer brakes you take, 
the fewer times you have to break your car and start again, the less abrasion you have. So traffic management or automatic traffic control systems play a crucial role in the future to reduce the emissions. Lastly, we also have another um, avenue that I think is very promising. It's consumer education. In particular, choosing tires that have a, a better abrasion resistance, vehicles that are lighter, so for example, less or fewer SUVs, change driving habits, so less aggressive driving, but try to keep constant speed, break as little as possible, only when, when it's really necessary. And finally, also education in the environmental impacts of these non-exhaust emissions, which will not go away when we change the entire fleet to electric, for example, that will not disappear. So that's reduction of the emissions, so right at the source. But we also have other options when we go to the reduction of the emissions. So in other words, the distribution of the tire particles that are inevitably abraded, how can we stop the spread of these particles in the environments? One successful approach is using porous as asphalt on roads. This has been successfully implemented, for example, on many roads in the Netherlands. Another possible way forward is sweeping and rinsing of roads in hot spots to remove them before they are uh, further um, community, community, commuted into cycles. So we can catch them before they are so small that we can't catch them anymore. Another approach is to improve storm water management and especially to limit road runoff. And of course the road runoff should be captured, especially in urban environments. So that isn't a costly, a costly approach, but it is necessary in particularly in urban environments. And up here, you see one of those drainages in a road in Philadelphia. And here it says it drains to the Schuylkill River. This is a major waterway. So this drain, which takes the runoff from a major road in Philadelphia, delivers the water directly to the river. And I wanna just demonstrate that to you. This is the bridge and you see here, this is the drainage. This is simply a pipe and the water comes out here and ends up in the river underneath. And I can show you now this as a movie. It's clearer during a recent rainstorm. Do you see the drainage as it comes straight from the road down into the river? So into our aquatic environment without any treatment. So capturing this road runoff and deliver it to a municipal wastewater treatment facility would significantly reduce the emission into the environment. And finally, I wanna thank my collaborators that are, um, a lot of them are actually in Germany and um, all of these collaborators are extremely important because they're specialized in various techniques and we have access to um, highways in Germany where we can set up our samplers. So without these collaborators, <clears throat> it would not have been possible to quantify the emission of tire and road wear particles. And with that, I thank you for your attention and um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have in the chat. Thank you very much for your attention. Fully, it is visible. And then I will start with my presentation. So dear ladies and gentlemen, this is a great pleasure for me uh, to, yeah, to could welcome you here for to the second uh, lecture event, uh, yeah, to the topic tire wear and emission of particles. So, and I will have a speech regarding tire rubber degradation in service. Uh, okay. Yeah, let's say this is a part of our book project uh, with the title Degradation of Elastomers in Practice Experiment and Modeling as Professor Heinrich introduced uh, yeah, at the beginning. Uh, within this project, uh, my research team contributed with three lectures or three chapters, uh, namely degradation of, uh, I will, uh, uh, yeah, switch on. Yeah, mainly degrade. Uh, ma uh, the first one was degradation of tire during intended usage. The second one was the effect of apparent crosslink density on cut and chip wear in nature rubber. And the third one was experimental and numerical description of the heat buildup in rubber under cyclic loading. So the third chapter. I will not present today because, as you see, this is a more this is a degradation topic for sure. However, uh, this is a topic more related to the temperature, and this 
will be presented that finally in the future together uh, within the presentation of a new book project which will which will come uh, at the beginning of the next year and uh, which is labeled advances in understanding thermal effects in rubber experiments modeling practical relevance so therefore today i will speak uh, about the content of these two uh, chapters and first Firstly, the first chapter will be degradation of tire during intended usage. So, prior to any other slides, I need to explain the scheme of tire rolling mechanisms that uh, everybody of us understand this. So, uh, when tire roll is uh, in a contact with a road for sure, and there is a, let's say, a footprint. So, here on the scheme on the left hand side, we see the rolling tire over the road, and the direction of a movement is uh, from the left to the right. Therefore, uh, the clockwise rolling direction occurs. So, uh, over the footprint area, there is a norm, normal constant pressure distribution resulting in a one single force, for example. And the red block here, uh, this is a, uh, let's say, the block which is at firstly in a contact with the road, and the green one is the last, has the last contact uh, during the rolling with the road. So have a look uh, closely into the detail, into the mechanisms. What we have here is Firstly, we see that the mechanism starts with a shearing. When the tire or the rubber block rolled over the asperity, then we have a, a concentration of a stress uh, in the vicinity of the, uh, of the asperity tip in the rubber block. Yeah. Secondly, we have a slipping during the rolling. Yeah, as you can very clearly see, we have some slipping distance, and the distance the rubber slides uh, over such a length of rubber over the tip of asperity. Yeah, again, close look uh, into the detail here. Uh, we can see that everything, and it's very important, that everything starts behind the asperity, not prior to asperity, however, behind the asperity. Behind the asperity, there is a stress concentration due to forces, these green forces acting due to friction. If you can see the direction of the forces, you can very clearly imagine what happened. In this direction, the rubber is stressed. And then here, it can be seen here, then orthogonally to this force direction and a crack driving force occur. Therefore, a crack in this direction proceed and the rubber will be, let's say, yeah, the crack will be initiated, propagates, and during the rolling, there will be a next phase. And this means run out, that is after the release, yeah, here in the part. So, a warm particle will be released from the uh, rubber block or rubber matrix. Yeah, and such warm particle can be created and emitted into the environment, as Professor Gire uh, explained previously. So, this is a general mechanism, and this mechanism of crack initiation and propagation, like the release of a rubber particle from the thread, is more or less independent of the road surface in general please uh, only the in intensities of the applied forces change with different pavement surface and choose also the rate of crack initiation and propagation so that's very important the mechanism is the same only the load or in other words, even the size of the asperities, the sharpness of the asperities, influences the everything what happened and the wire as well. So therefore, an increase in the road surface roughness, as you can very clearly see here from a very smooth one to a very rough one, even if the tires are rolling over pure, pure quality roads and so on, it causes increase in rate of crack initiation, propagation, and finally, worn particle size. So, 
here I would like to share with you uh, some examples of real damage to tire. These are photos of four different tire tires, tire types or applications. Uh, yeah, and uh, here on the left hand side we can see a personal car tire. Uh, here, upper right hand side, there is a forestry tire. Bottom part of the left side, there is a track tire and multi-purpose tire. So why I show these four very different application? I'm showing this because in all of these application, all verb phenomena are present. This is a dependent, uh, independent on the application. So we can see here, for example, fatigue wear. Yeah, I'm sorry, in the forestry, a fatigue wear it would be really surprising if some occur because it's rolling really over very hard terrain and very sharp asperities and so on. So how on these three, we can very clearly see a fatigue, fatigue wear for sure uh, in the green local spots. So here on all of them, we can clearly see some abrasive wear. And finally, cutting wear is visible on all of these tires and yeah maybe it's wondering how this is visible even on the personal car tire cut and chip wear very clearly visible on on more locations yeah that is and here uh, let's say yeah this is a very large chunk out of the material from the thread not only like from a typical uh chip and chuck process, how this is really uh, slipped over very sharp uh, aspirity and, and that was a very big uh, part released uh, from the thread. However, here around we can very clearly see there is a chunk out material, a typical chunk out material and multi-purple style as well. Yeah, very typical one, a big piece is released from the surface. So, yeah, let's say, yeah, if we see such a let's say, a complex problem in a wear phenomena, then it uh, needs to be put in one question. And one of the most important challenges in the tire industry that needs to be addressed is to optimize the rubber resistance against real damage. This needs to be solved. Everybody would like to have it and everybody would like to produce compounds which will be resistant against everything and against uh, all the damages. Maybe it's possible, maybe not. We know the tr magic triangle <laughs> and so on. So, OK, how to do it? Traditional way to produce resistant rubber is in generally that firstly, rubber compound is developed then yeah finally and produced of course and then finally the complete process needs to be carried out to tire production and then finally tire field test is performed to analyze really the quality and the resistance of a tire and this is very time and money consuming process to do it so yeah that needs to be really really a lot of time so why to, not to do it on another way, more efficient? And the more efficient way to produce ra resistant rubber is, let's say, finally, it would be great if we could only and develop and produce rubber compound and then to know everything. So it would be great, of course. So if we will do so, then we would need to be focused on a laboratory testing and to do everything inside the laboratory in the case of analyzing and characterizing the behavior on a, a yeah, test pieces. And that would be really great because if this would be achieved, then we will save a lot of time and money, even the personal requirement, and we will enhance the testing repeatability for sure. Yeah. That is that would be, and therefore let's say this process we would really like to implement fully to maximally avoid not fully of course maybe our maximally avoid the tire field testing and to save as I mentioned time and money and to get the repeatability data and physically describe and so on that's our aim. Okay, 
to do so, we need to firstly understand some theoretical background. Yeah, the all phenomena, fracture phenomena, I mean, can be explained within this paris Erdogan plot, also called fatigue growth diagram. Uh, this is well known for those who are working with fracture mechanic of rubber, not only rubber, even steel and so on. However, uh, about rubber, I will go slightly into detail and describe this diagram. So we have here the relation between energy release rate or tearing energy on the x-axis. You can uh, yeah, associate this even only with the load applied uh, on a tire. And on the y-axis, we have a crack growth rate. So how quickly the crack growth uh, cracks propagate and, and, and so on. So there we have an, uh, different uh, regions here. The first region is uh, region below T0. T0 is a value labeled like fatigue threshold or intrinsic strength. And below the T0, there is no crack initiation, no crack propagation. However, from a mechanical loading, please, do please understand me correctly. Mechanical loading. Yeah? There are, of course, crack initiation below T0. However, they are they are uh, caused due to, for example, a zone acting and so on. However, not mechanically. Yeah? That starts firstly with T0. So then there is a re region two. Uh, there is a very uh, quick increase in a crack road rate uh, that is, uh, let's say, an unstable crack propagation you can really imagine when the when the crack will be initiated even it will be initiated on a very short in uh, nanometers micrometers and so on how this process propagates uh, or uh, proceed very quickly uh, this is an unstable one and then it decelerate and we will come over to the third region which is labeled stable crack growth rate uh, that's mean the crack propagation is uh, more or less linear. And then we will be very close to this TC. And TC mean, mean ultimate strength. That's mean the rubber will be totally break or ruptured. And we are not able to save anymore. The product or rubber matrix doesn't matter. So this is a very critical uh, value then. Yeah? OK, this is the complete curve which can describe the behavior. However, I spoke prior to this speech to, uh, regarding the where, how the where is related to such a diagram. So fatigue where is in such a region, such a value of a crack growth rate over a different tearing energy level. While over the tearing energy level, you should imagine we can have a different material. The material can be really, a, really a very resistant, uh, has a high T0, and we can move to the right-hand side. Yeah, And even in the very high T0, there will be uh, yeah, fatigue wear and so on. So therefore, then the abrasive wear is somewhere here, approximately, and then, is a cutting wear or cut and chip wear. And this is here. Here, we can really overlap the complete diagram with a wear phenomenon. That everything happened. And what we need to understand is that, of course, yeah, fatigue wear proceed with a, a lower tearing energy compared to TC and so on. That's very, very logical. So, next point is that. Of course, with a crack growth rate increase, the size of one particle increase as well, yeah, from a nanometer up to yeah, centimeters. Okay, and how to determine and describe it uh, this in a laboratory? We have a set of uh, unique equipments which can do that very efficiently. Firstly, there is an equipment here in fatigue analyzer which can describe the completely, completely the Paris Erdogan curve or fatigue crack growth curve. This is the black one from the T0 up to TC. However, uh, those who uh, from you were uh, present in our last or first uh, webinar, uh, I presented the time required for the, yeah, determining the data close to T0. And I mentioned uh, on that time that I needed seven months to get 
one value or not one value, however, to describe this second region. Only this, seven months. It's an amazing time uh, requirement. So it's not possible to do so only for one material. Therefore, it was uh, yeah, required to describe or to determine the T0 and the values around the T0 on more an efficient way, on a quicker time or a shorter time, and to do so. So therefore, the T-lymphatic analyzer is a very unique and efficient equipment, which is able very quickly to describe within few hours this middle part. And for the T0 and TC, we need something other to do it very efficiently. And this is intrinsic strength analyzer. With the intrinsic strength analyzer, it is possible to determine T0 value, this fatigue threshold, as well as TC, the ultimate strength. And this is possible to be done within one up to from one up to two hours in dependence upon two loading conditions. So in comparison to seven months, this is so high the advantage of this testing methodology that is really an amazing one. So we can very quickly describe these two values or determine these two values. So therefore, let's say we have everything to describe the complete fatigue crack growth curve. We have the middle part, we have the uh, starting part and the yeah, part uh, close or close to ultimate strength, everything we have so to describe it. However, how to do it, let's say, or you should imagine uh, like a cut and chip on tire. This is a, a big piece is released from a tire thread and this is mainly characterized uh, with a, a high roughness of the thread and so on. And to do so, to describe it so that we really understand that the cut and chip process occur as a cut and chip process uh, on a tire and to predict it directly on a tire, uh, we developed in another equipment, which is instrumented cut and chip analyzer. Uh, that is really only focusing on description, physically description, of a cut and chip process directly close to TC and so on, independence of a loading condition. So let's say using this set of three unique devices, it is possible to describe the fracture processes that comprehensively describe the threat well. So as you can see, starting from intrinsic strength analyzer over t lymphatic analyzer up to instrumented cut and chip analyzer, as well, the increase in rate of crack initiation, propagation, and vore particle size uh, is uh, proceeds. So that is, yeah. However, that was only let's say um, theory, and uh, you doesn't need to trust me if this works or not. So therefore, we of course did a, an evaluation study. So three materials, and you know, uh, I'm sure I'm using very often these three basic fundamental materials, always the same, uh, to uh, evaluate some new phenomena. So these are based on pure styrene butadiene rubber, nature rubber, and butadiene rubber, all uh, filled or reinforced with 50 PHR of carbon black. So, yeah, the first determination of T0 and TC using ISA. What we got on the data from the equipment, these are listed in this table on the left hand side. So you can see that intrinsic strength T0 is from nature rubber, from the uh, yeah, small value one up to the large one. That's mean nature rubber has the uh, lower T0 value, then it's SBR, and the um, highest T0 value has the BR material. Yeah. Exactly the opposite trend. The opposite trend is observed for the TC, for the ultimate strength. That's mean the highest TC has the nature rubber and the lowest butadiene rubber. So that is, let's say, uh, yeah, very clear from for those who really know how these materials should behave. What does it mean in generally? That mean that nature rubber with the lowest T0 has the lowest resistance against abrasion, fatigue abrasion. However, 
the largest resistance has the Buddha tree and rubber. And exactly the opposite is that the nature of it compared to this has the highest resistance against cutting processes, cutting wear, and Buddha DNA and rubber has the lowest resistance against cutting wear or cutting chip wear. Okay, cure and fatigue analyzer. This is the equipment which describes the middle part of the curve. So what we got for these three materials, it's presented here in this, this diagram. And uh, yeah, we can see it very clearly here. So uh, that is mainly, let's say, can be explained on the slope of the curve presented here. So we see that the nature of it has the lowest slope. This is, this is the blue one. Then it's followed by the SBR, and then the BR has the highest slope. What does it mean? That means that once there is a crack initiated in such a rubber, nature rubber will be mostly resistant against crack propagation, followed by SBR, and the less resistant will be the butadiene rubber. Yeah, in general, in the stable crack root regime three, as I presented. So that's mean we have every data measured we need to create a complete curve and to understand the, completely the wear mechanisms. So ranking here, the data are the complete Paris Erdogan on fatty curve, uh, curves are presented here on the right hand side and this is, let's say, the left-hand side. This is a ranking of rubber resistance to individual wear mechanisms. So here we can see that for starting from the fatigue wear, we have the lowest resistant NR followed by SBR, and the largest resistant is BR. That's exactly because of this ranking. NR has the lowest B, uh, T0, then it's followed by SBR, and largest T0 has the BR material. Then we have the abrasive wear. And the abrasive wear, it's more complicated because as you see, we have here some crossing point, a lot of crossing points between the behavior. Therefore, let's say we will, yeah, observed data only at the beginning of such a um, region and at the end of this region we will see that firstly that's exactly correspond with the fatigue where that's mean the lowest resistance has has the nr followed by sbr and then br and then finally at the end of this re region we have exactly the another opposite uh, another uh, the opposite opposite behavior. So that's mean the most resistant is BR followed by uh, uh, so, sorry less resistant is BR then followed by SBR and the highest resistant uh, has an NR material. And this on the next point this exactly corresponds with the cut and chip wear or cutting wear here in the middle. Yeah, the lowest resistant BR. Highest uh, the middle one is SBR and the highest resistant NR. And as I mentioned. This is well known that the NR material, which is here with the lowest T0, is less resistant against fatigue wear. However, has highest resistant against cut and chip. And this is exactly op opposite for the BR. Highest resistance for fatigue wear, lowest resistance for cut and chip wear. So exactly matching the well-known behavior. So, however, how this corresponds with the data, yeah, getting from an instrumented cut and chip analyzer, the data from the, let's say, determination of a damage of a uh, rubber surface, really as it happened on a, on a tire track. So, here you can see the data from our experiment photographs at the end of the experiment for NR with an increase of a normal force or loading for SBR and for BR. These are the photographs and you can, for example, see that more or less we have here some diagonal where 
below the diagonal, there is an cut and chip there increasing. However, over in the upper part of the diagonal, there is a no cut and chip there. Yeah, that's clearly visible here. So that's mean in the case uh, on NR, you can see always cut and chip. SBR up to some middle loading, there is no cut and chip, and then it starts rapidly. And for the BR, over very broad range of applied loading, there is nothing, happened nothing. However, when it starts, it will be destroyed immediately. It's visible here with a one first shot or impact. The sample is totally broken uh, or chunked out totally. So, and that's exactly, let's say, corresponds here with these diagrams. You can see here that at the beginning, yeah, I will slightly describe, sorry, the diagram what we see here, that is on the X axis, we have a applied no loading, that's mean applied normal force loading on the sample. And on the Y axis, we have cut and chip damage P parameter. That's mean when it's increased, the cut and chip damage P parameter, then the there will be the um, surface or the thread more destroyed, chunked out, less or lower CC damage P parameter, then less chunked out from the thread, yeah? then more resistant to cut and chip. So therefore, the let's say starting with BR, we see that BR it has a lowest, lowest P value for the, let's say, yeah, the starting part. Then we have an uh, SBR and then NR. However, when coming to the very high loading, then the NR became the most resistant one. You can very clearly see it. And if you saw correctly uh, the data from the tear and fatigue analyzer, I will show you this now. Sorry, uh, sorry, yeah, sorry, one, one back. Uh, yeah, uh, these are, one back more. Yeah, these are here. You can clearly see that these are the crossing points here, exactly as visible here in that part. Yeah, in this part, yeah, we have the crossing points exactly visible here again. And when we will now observe the slopes of these curves and the slopes of these curves we have here, I will now hear uh, the relation, we'll present the relation where we have on the X axis, the slopes of the cure from cut and chip analyzer and on the Y axis, the slopes from the tear and fatigue analyzer, we got, yeah, let's say the relation, uh, yeah, 94%, it's more or less identical one. Yeah what we have from cut and chip and what we have here. So exactly everything is matching well and the data nicely corresponds and show, show what we need to measure. So that's an amazing one. Okay, so that was the, let's say, outcome of this uh, first chapter. And the second one is the effect of apparent cross-link density on cut and chip wear in nature rubber. Yeah, directly to the material study, this was really focused on this cut and chip, what I presented now a last, last part from the previous chapter. So what we investigated here is a material, yeah, which was based on nature rubber, uh, and uh, the different cross-link density we achieved with uh, different amount of accelerator. Yeah, that is here, from a very low one up to very high one, and with the uh, yeah uh, ratio of accelerator and cell sulfur from 0 0.1 up to 0 0.1 up to 0 0.6 we were in the conventional system 
then in a semi-efficient system, and then what we got even as well is an efficient one. Yeah, the complete systems are uh, clearly demonstrated here and investigated as well. So this is the diagram where we have on the x-axis uh, this uh, ratio accelerated to sulfur, uh, and on the y-axis the measured apparent crosslink density in a micromole per cubic centimeter. And what we can clearly see is again the association of the conventional semi-efficient and efficient system with the crosslink density. Conventional system was up to uh, 240 uh, micromole per cubic centimeter done. Uh, then uh, semi-efficient was from uh, 240 up to 440 uh, micromole per cubic centimeter. And then the last one over 440 was that uh, efficient one. Here, the fundamental behavior of such uh, material, and sorry, one point back, why the two curves, <laughs> I totally forgot to say that we have two curves because what we did was even the green one is a for material which was cured directly at T90 time, and the orange one was uh, evaluated for over curing time 10 minutes over T T90 uh, because of we had a nature rubber. So we demonstrated now really the reversion and the destruction of a rubber matrix due to over curing. And this is clearly visible here that the crosslink density decreases. So now the data from the fundamental uh, behavior. Uh, again, associated with a conventional uh, system, semi-efficient and efficient one. What we can see clearly is that here we have a tensile strength and elongation and break. In a conventional system, the tensile strength increases, yeah, and then over that conventional system starts to decrease up to efficient one. What we can see for the elongation and break, there is a more or less a constant and then in the middle part of the conventional system it starts to decrease over all conventional system in the uh, from the measurement of hardness we can clearly see that the hardness increases uh, with the increase of uh, crosslink density that means over the co uh, conventional and semi efficient system whereas then we can see an efficient system and a decrease again OK, however, what was the uh, aim of this work was a cut and chip abrasion. And here we can see uh, the photographs of the cut and chip uh, or chipped uh, samples after the measurement. And this is again uh, yeah, related to the different curing system. Firstly, conventional one, then it's efficient one, and then it's a uh, semi-efficient one, and then it's an efficient one. Association with a crosslink densities. What we can see is very huge difference between conventional and the other remaining, other two remaining. We can see that here for the conventional system, more or less very low cut and chip phenomena over different loading has been achieved. For the 100, then uh, low, uh, Newton, the loading force, we can see that independently on the curing system, there is more or less no cut and chip or very less cut and chip in the case. And the very worst <laughs> re region is semi efficient and efficient when the loading is increased. So this is clearly visible from the photographs. And here are the pure data. What we can see here is the green curves are for the lowest loading, which is the 100 Newton. And we can clearly see the data shows there proceed more or less anything. Everything is stable and a constant. So for low loading, there is no dependence on a crosslink density. The another, yeah, another, another behavior is when the loading increases. So for 150 and 200, this is the, uh, let's say, the red one and the violet one. So we can see that over the 
conventional system, up to the end of the conventional system, we have more or less constant values of uh, resistance or cut and chip damage P parameter. How, when we are close to the uh, end of the uh, conventional system, or yeah, and at these crosslink densities, then the cut and chip damage increases rapidly, uh, totally. You can see it here immediately, yeah, on the photographs. When we are over two, yeah, 230 uh, micromoles per cubic centimeter, then you can see how large chunked out, uh, yeah, occurs in the material. Stepwise increase, and then the material is totally destroyed. That we doesn't need to speak about the material anymore. So there is required to have a look closely deep in this region. This is a very interesting region because what happened here is we have a slight increase in a crosslink density within this region up to 200 micromoles per cubic centimeter. With increasing loading, the CC damage P parameter decreases. That is that very amazing point with increased loading where we would expect there will be larger damage. No, this is not the case. It's decreases. The damage will be lower one. So the material will be tougher, more tougher. And this is because of strain induced crystallization occurring in such uh, um, strain level. Here, strain crystallized are uh, in, um, uh, induced and that is everything starts. So the material will be more tougher, more resistant. However, with next increase of a crosslink density, yeah, we will not see it anymore and the material will be broken. So no more resistance. So that's an amazing one results. And we can, let's say, slightly conclude even from this part. And this is, let's say, in comparison, cut and chip and this fundamental measurement, we can say that rubber has the highest resistance against cut and chip wear and additional optimal fundamental behavior within the conventional curing system. That is a very important observation from this chapter. And we are working on with a next study where we are now not, um, yeah, let's say worry, worrying accelerator, content of accelerator. However, worrying, uh, let's say, the um, uh, content of a sulfur. And we will see what the rate are. Then finally, I will present this as well uh, within some future uh, webinar. So, OK, and I will conclude the work. And let's say this will be very easy conclusion. Uh, I try to demonstrate that within using of this set of three unique equipments, we are really able to analyze completely the fracture behavior of uh, yeah, material used for tire application. In relation to the wear, we can clearly associate, we can clearly predict the future behavior. Therefore, we can very clearly in a laboratory scale predict the future behavior of a tire, and there is a possible to enhance uh, the development and save a lot of time and money for the development. So, and here I am on the end of my presentation, and I would like to thank to you,